Welcome to Amusement Sparks. This is the remodels and renovations episode for season three. We're going to take a look at our past five parks and hopefully improve upon them and add to them. With me today, who do I have? That was a weird sentence, but hey, introduce myself, please. I mean yourselves. Oh my god. <laughs> hey, I'm Tyler Trosper from the Xenoblade episode. I'm uh, I'm John Kanoki from Cinema 7. I'm uh, Mario Bakari from Cinema 7. Uh, my name is Ben. Hi. Uh, should I just give the uh, yep. give where I come from now? <laughs> <laughs> that was perfect. Perfect. No, that's all we need. Great Excellent. <laughs> why, why do we know you? Why might your voice sound familiar? If my voice sounds familiar, you probably either heard me on uh, the Mega Man Upgrade episode of your podcast, Andrew, or um, you may have heard of... The Carton Cast, which is a podcast that my me and my uh, brother Zane run uh, over at the Fancy Bat Network, um, wherein we talk about old cartoons and see what we think of them as adults. Tagline. Uh, <laughs> Taglines are nice. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, gl- I'm so glad we figured that one out. Up until that 15th episode, I was just guessing. I was just like, this is the show where we watch old cartoons and we like them and you don't have to watch them, but now you know of them. <laughs> I was just kind of making it, making it up as I went. And that one's also true. It just isn't as, it, it could be punched up a little not, bit. Not quite as snappy. Yeah. I also appear on Empowered, a superpower discussion podcast, which is like five minutes long. That is a super fun show, little bite sized episodes. Mm, decadent. And so there's just tons of them out there. So even if one episode is horrible, you can just skip it and go to the next one. Um, (laughs) It's really fun because, like, these superpowers are just, like, so off the wall and, like, it just leads to really funny discussion. Yeah, if you ever wanted a moral discussion about the uh, responsibility that the ability to having your blood turn into paper grants you, (laughs) then that's the show for you. (laughs) And right now you guys are in the middle of Talus Month, is that right? Could you tell us about that? (laughs) That is right. Thank you for remembering the name correctly. Oh, of course. I've been listening. uh, (laughs) Right now uh, we are coming off the 100th episode of the Carton Cast where we talked about Jackie Chan Adventures. Great cartoon. Um, and focuses around the 12 animals of the Chinese Zodiac and these talismans that each have a magic power corresponding to that animal. Um, So sort of cross-promotion, we're doing something in Empowered wherein we discuss a superpower such as super strength from the ox talisman or astral projection from the sheep talisman. If you like Jackie Chan adventures, you'll probably like those. Um, The first park of the season was Mega Man Upgrade, which is almost like a first-person shooter kind of park. Like, it's based on laser tag, where each person takes the role of a human who is being trained by Dr. Light and Mega Man to be, like, kind of a Mega Man-style hero. So you use kind of, like, critical thinking and puzzle solving to help, like, figure out your plan of attack, because there's several different courses that you go through to end up fighting each of the robot masters, like these big robot bosses that you have to fight at the end of each level. So there's a plaza in the middle with a lot of, like, fun stuff you can do, you know, eat food, shop, hang out, and also customize your avatar, because each part guest is their own character. So, like, you can customize different weaponry that you have, different accessories that you have, and just kind of, like, what you look like. This this park is very heavy on augmented reality and virtual reality. Every part guest wears like a helmet that's got a visor, and so you can kind of customize the way that you see the world around you. Uh, really high-level players might have a very minimal display where it you know doesn't show them much information, whereas a total newbie to the park it might give them like you know a, they'll have a map of the park in one corner. It'll have like little pop-ups telling them and explaining to them what's going on around them, so they can kind of get adjusted to it. So I don't know. It's a really customizable, um, interactive shooting obstacle course. I don't think there's anything like this in the real world right now, but I do think it's kind of around the corner with the way that VR is developing and the future of like laser tag, I think definitely lies in this uh, arena. Um, what were your thoughts about this episode? Do you have any, any ideas of what you'd want to add to it? It's a very physically intensive park, so I don't, didn't know if there would be a way to like have some type of... Uh rest area i was like i'd be really tired really quickly at this part (laughs) i think almost everyone would be exhausted pretty quickly and yeah you're totally right it's going to be like a pretty high intensity experience when you're actually in the the stages so i think that expanding and improving upon the plaza like the main more comfortable less workout-ish type of area is a really uh important thing to do 
So yeah, we wanted to like have areas where you could kind of customize your avatar because this is in augmented reality. So when you look at another part guest, you don't see their like human form necessarily. You see what they want you to see. Like you get to customize your appearance to the other players. So in the plaza, you can kind of customize your character. You can upgrade your equipment. And um, there's a lot of other like, you know, more comfortable things to do, like a food court. There's games, there's an arcade, there's that kind of stuff as well. And you can also go watch. There's going to be an arena where you can watch people battle in player versus player, more like traditional laser tag kind of environments, but where each Mm -hmm. person is using their own customized weapons. Like, you know, the weapons they got from defeating all these robot masters and from returning to the park and leveling up their character. So it's going to be kind of like a Coliseum type of thing, I guess. Um, But that should be fun, hopefully, not too exhausting. But yeah, a lot of it would be very physically taxing. I guess I like the idea of, of like having it as an extension of the the Capcom park. Having the crossover between the two would be really cool because Mega Man is you know created by Capcom. Um, and one other thing that might make you happy, Tyler, is the uh, we had some like ideas for roller coasters that would basically be like you can sit on a roller coaster and kind of like shoot stuff as well. So we could maybe expand that a little bit more to have a less physically demanding thing where you're not like (laughs) running and jumping and like sweating your butt off all the time, but you can still play as like a Mega Man type character where you get to like, you know, shoot the bad guys and collect the power ups and all that stuff. We could do maybe like a vehicle based mode like where you're, you know, riding in the back of like a truck and you have to like, so it's more like um, an on rails shooter kind of thing. That's a good, uh, a good little tweak, especially for people, you know, who have like mobility concerns or anything like that um you still want the theme park to be fun for for everybody because of the structure of the park i think most of these courses are already relatively vehicle friendly like you could just kind of add you know drop in a uh, a golf cart and you can still go through it just like normal uh, one other thing i kind of wanted to think about here was like adding in like maybe more um kind of like a role-playing sort of element like a lot of the other episodes of this show we've kind of got into this sort of role-playing experience type of deal where you know, you play as a character and you get to go around and talk mm-hmm. to people and like choose what you do with your time and that impacts the storyline. And I think that would mm-hmm. be important to do here too. So it's not just a sport. It's like there's a world to it and there's a story to it. And I think that adding more of the role playing thing would be something to do in your, your time in between matches or when you're trying to like recover from, you know, sprinting and sweating your butt off. It's like, well, you can go do the, you know, this role playing activity where you uh, complete some side quests and explore the theme park a little bit more and d- delve into the story a little bit more yeah because um wasn't like uh, Mega Man legend and uh, those network games were kind of more story heavy yeah definitely with some cool rpg mechanics and that's a really good idea um there were definitely some vehicle based levels in Mega Man legends that's a good source that's a good idea we should pull from that uh, well, I like I like the whole idea of the laser tag thing. I don't know if you remember uh, Discovery Zone used to have like a uh, laser thing where you'd shoot monsters. I think it was. You go into this. Uh, I don't know if you guys know what I'm talking about when I say Discovery Zone. Oh yeah, I love Discovery Zone, but I don't remember this. It's like a, a laser tag thing or like a shooting gallery. Yeah, kind of. And these things would pop up, and you can uh, shoot them. I, I've never went to Discovery Zone, and I always wanted to go because of this. <laughs> this like idea and running through and shooting these boards with this like laser, you know, or whatever. It definitely sounds like this is kind of an evolution of that, that same idea. It, you know, it's basically like a, a interactive shooting gallery thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, could... I... Go ahead. No, you go ahead, Mar. I, you, I forgot what I was going to say because of your beautiful voice. <laughs> oh guys, come on. I, I was just going to say, I, I like the idea of, uh, a VR obstacle course. It's it's kind of crazy because it almost blends VR and augmented reality at the same time because you have to be able to see what you're doing so you're not fully immersed. But at the same time, like maybe maybe you could have some sort of home functionality. That's what I was Whoa. thinking. You know, dude. Yes, you're totally right because like the the course itself, like the actual facility, like if you take off your helmet and you don't look through the visor. It's going to look very boring, like just white walls, white floor. A lot of the stuff you're interacting with, you know, is just kind of painted on there in VR or in AR. Um, So doing this at home, I think, would totally work. You know, it might take some, I'm not sure exactly how quick the technology would be, um, because we do want it to be like, the the game kind of needs to be aware of your environment. It's not like Pokemon Go, where it's just going to like have a character floating over whatever you're aiming at. Like we need it to have some interact 
interactability, <laughs> I think, where it's like, oh, hey, that's a wall. Okay, let's have an enemy pop out of that, or, like, let's attach something to that wall. Like, it needs to be able to recognize these things. So I don't know if it, like, instantly scans it, or if you need to kind of program it. Like, maybe it, it asks you to walk around the perimeter of your room, and then it's like, okay, now we know where the room is laid out like, and this is where we can put enemies and stuff. What was that Mega Man game on the Game Boy Advance where you kind of went into, like, the computer? Battle Network. Yeah, I love that game. Yeah, it could be something like that. That would be awesome. Yeah, the, the combat was, like, each each person had a, like, 3x3 three three grid, and they were smashed up together. Like, so it kind of, I don't know, looked like a chessboard or a checkerboard almost, and you would move your character around, and, like, it was like a really fast-paced, turn-based battle thing. It wasn't really turn-based, though, I guess. But I don't know, it's like a strategy game. Yeah, kind of, almost. Like the Fire Emblem games? Yeah, 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 like that. But, like, a lot faster paced, like, with the Mega Man kind of pacing. Yeah. But that'd be awesome as, like, a two-player game in VR. You know, you kind of control where your characters go. And so it's almost like a, a card game. You know, you could make it an interactive card game. And there there is a Mega Man card game. Like, I don't think it's unheard of to kind of translate Mega Man Battle Network into an actual card game. In fact, I think I have a booster box of a defunct card game that was based on that concept. Um, but doing it in VR would be pretty... That would be pretty neat. Obviously, you're including the villains, right? You said, like, there's... A... Yeah, we're going to, like, rotate them out. Like, every season, there will be a new crop of, of eight more Robot Masters. you got to get those people coming back. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, in the, the Mega Man series, you know, when you beat an enemy, you get a weapon from them that kind of mimics their power in a way. So, like, it'd be really cool to be a return guest because you get to collect more and more weapons. You know, theoretically, every, like, three months you can get a whole new selection of eight weapons. So you can, like, fully customize your, your character as, as best you want. Yeah, that'd be cool. And you can uh, choose which one you want to bring and everything. Yeah, there's, like, a whole strategy thing. Like, even though it's, a you know, fast-paced, like, just shooting... It almost sounds kind of brainless when you describe it that way, but there is a really complex, like, rock-paper-scissors mechanic to which weapon and which upgrade you should use to fight a certain enemy. If you did stuff like that, you could unlock, like, outfits for your game at home or something. Oh, that's cool. Have it interact with the other games. That's really fun. And this game was produced by Capcom. It'd be cool if we could have maybe, like, different avatar skins that are based on characters from other games and stuff, like the way we did it with the Capcom theme park. Like, take the kind of cross-pollination of various Capcom games and, like, sprinkle that into the park here at Mega Man Upgrade. I think that'd be pretty cool. You could even get certain weapons from other games as well. Almost like a, uh, a Yoshi's Woolly World with a bunch of Amiibos. How the Yoshi just Aww. gets all the skins. Yeah. Yeah, that's really fun. I, I keep talking about like Super Smash Bros. kind of thing, like Amiibo functionality of the way that those characters play so nicely with each other. Like I think that's a very Capcom type of, of approach to games where it's like, I know this character is not from this game, but let's either directly reference them or bring them in anyway, just for fun. Like, I don't know. I love that kind of toy box approach to, to storytelling and game design. I think that's, that's the way to go. So we should definitely continue that tradition. Also with the, uh, create your own character. Maybe you can have kids like paint their own amiibo figure or old Mega Man figure. I love that a lot. And you could just have blanks of like the kind of, you know, different archetypes of the different, you know, avatars that people would build. You just have blank white ones, and people could either paint it themselves or have it professionally or mechanically printed. Yeah. And you could even include some kind of amiibo-type technology. It's really cool to be able to customize and be like, this this is me when I go to this theme park. Like, <laughs> yeah. That's my dude. It's so cool. I wish this was real right now. I totally hope this is a thing that like the next generation can like grow up playing, because it, it sounds so fun. <laughs> I was just listening to one of your episodes. Um, what was it? The Capcom one, maybe? Yeah. And you were bemoaning the fact that the future of theme parks probably was just a bunch of black boxes in a parking lot. Yeah, well, well, that was the issue. The issue is the, the interactability with it. Like, I do. Right. I, I can't argue that AR and VR aren't going to be important to the future, but I don't want to sit inside of a box and, like, that's it. I want to be able to, like, yeah. run around and play and climb on stuff. But if you're if you're yeah. in a box, you feel like a consumer. If you if you're mm. in Mega Man Upgrade, you feel like a robot warrior. Yes, absolutely. For anyone who's played like laser tag and has had like more modern laser tag experiences, where you can get kind of get those special powers like radar jammer or rapid fire or shotgun or things like that, um, that's kind of the the idea that we want to go for there. Yeah, it's that. But instead of just being generic 
nameless sci-fi it's like no actually... you get a fish cannon on your arm <laughs> the shoot out big fish that spit out smaller fish wow i i hadn't seen that one come through r&d yet but that's a that's a great power <laughs> <laughs> matrice cadol fish <laughs> you didn't uh you, i didn't send you I the, notes the on memo that? Um, no, that's awesome. I, I love the idea in like the flavor and all that that adds and being able to customize yourself in like your weapon is so cool. It could be kind of cool to just kind of like have a lot of like kind of spooky, uh, robot masters around Halloween or wintry ones in the winter time and summery ones in the summertime, like kind of makes sense to just do it logically instead of just randomly. They had, uh, in, um, one of the Mega Man games, I think it was maybe Mega Man, uh, seven with a uh, shade man and he had a big vampire affectation so Whoa. the stage was you went through kind of like a spooky forest and there were a lot of pumpkin robots that jumped out at you which is like my favorite thing in mega man is they're just like make it a robot <laughs> like it doesn't <laughs> like robot second theme first yes you know? yeah it's so true um, and that's what we need to follow with this park too <laughs> yeah absolutely everything for like so if you did want to do like tiny pumpkin robots shooting smaller like Candy corn. Yeah, exactly. Candy <laughs> corn at you. That's totally viable. Oh, man. I, I would really love to have the, the Buster upgrade that just launches Halloween candy out. You know, video game tournaments are a huge thing now. Blizzard hosts those all the time. You could actually have, like, uh, and, like a tournament, like a worldwide tournament, sort of like wow. a Ninja Warrior thing, but <sighs> combined with this weird video game aesthetic. That's so cool. We kind of talked about doing, like, a, a player versus player area where you mm -hmm. just kind of get to duel, you know, basically more of a regular laser tag experience. Like, just a bunch of Mega Men in training battling each other with their chosen powers. That would naturally lend itself to competitive tournaments and, like, pro-level play. And maybe even having, like, an arena where you can just kind of watch more skilled players in a pvp environment right and what would be what would be so cool is because you could have the skin for whatever their particular designs are on it wouldn't be like two kids playing laser tag it would look like an episode of reboot yes or koilioko or something right but in real life <laughs> yeah we had talked about like each person's uh perception of the other people like your avatar is totally customizable so you can look like something that you are not at all which, yeah, makes watching people play feel even more immersive and even more real. The second episode from Season 3 was based on Nickelodeon. This was a, an interconnected network of different Nickelodeon worlds. It had adventure, humor, and discovery flowing throughout the entire park. Um, it basically didn't have much of a, an innovation in the way that the park is structured. Other than it's a bunch of worlds from Nickelodeon, like these different shows have their own little lands, and they're all connected in kind of original ways. Like a lot of them are connected through the sewers, because there's stuff like All Real Monsters and uh, Ninja Turtles. That way you could like come out of the sewer and you're like at the Pickles house from Rugrats, or go through the sewers and come out and you're like at like Doug's house. One other method of transitioning from one to the other was the Wild Thornberry's Comv vehicle, which is like an all-terrain camper van kind of thing. We had that as like a vehicle that can kind of fast travel to different points in the world. I was just asked by my uh, by my friend to do a Wild Thornberry's episode purely <laughs> to talk about Nigel Thornberry memes. Oh man, <laughs> he's fascinating. Yeah, cartoon dads. Cartoon dads. Yeah. Wow. It's like Jimmy Neutron's dad and and Doug Funny's. That dad could be its and... own podcast, like analyzing, you know the the psychology of a cartoon dad they're they're always like well-meaning but impotent it's mm -hmm. like a fascinating dichotomy and zane and i always love talking about those but <laughs> you could definitely have like an attraction of cartoon dads just all sitting around a breakfast table <laughs> drinking coffee and commenting on the world around them that's really cute that would be so entertaining like if you go into like a restaurant and there's one table that's all actors playing all of these different dads just being goofballs I really loved like the layout of it being all in interconnected. The idea of having not just one main path through it, like a regular theme park, you like <clears throat> it's laid out like you know a figure eight or a big oval or whatever. It's like well, obviously this is what we have to do. This way, having like you know even unexpected uh, routes and just vertical tons space, of them. definitely. Ooh, yeah, I like that. And having the the network of like not gross, nice, clean sewers. Um, as a way of transporting around would be really fun with like rivers of slime yeah. and yeah i think i think it'd be a good time i, I wasn't yeah. aware whether this was only for cartoons or if it was just nickelodeon as a whole um we 
basically there's so much to cover with Nickelodeon that we were like, okay, let's only go up through like the year 2000. And let's only talk about the cartoons for the most part. We like reference some of the other like live action shows, but is there something you want to add in particular? I was just thinking like uh, Salute Your Shorts might go down really well as kind of like not quite in the park, but kind of an outskirts mm-hmm. sort of rest area. Like, you know, or Are You Afraid of the Dark? You know, there's a lot of like yes. kind of wilderness centric shows that were actually live action. That would be really cool to just see referenced. Yeah, and those could be kind of kind of in the same area like those two shows pair really nicely like during the day it's it's um salute your shorts and then like during the night it's are you afraid of the dark especially if you wanted to get away from all like the the cartoony stuff like this is just where regular people hang out and there are still attractions there but if you don't want to see you know goddard barking like crazy then you don't have to yeah give some variety and then you could have like I don't know, you can even have cabins out there, like, have it be, like, a kind of wilderness retreat hotel where people can actually stay there and then, like, journey into the park during the day. That would be super cool. Yeah, that works. That's Mm -hmm. fun. And then you've got all the fun, like, uh, you know, kind of, like, summer camp games that you could, like, have kids play. Because I'm sure, you know, a lot of kids are going to be going here, being that it's based on Nickelodeon. So, yeah, that, Mm -hmm. that really works. The idea of going to a theme park where I can be entertained when I want to, but can just take a hike if I feel like it, Mm -hmm. that is beautiful to me. That's really cool, because I, I do think these, the kind of cartoony suburbs areas are going to be, like, you know, kind of loud and very colorful, and, yeah. um, yeah, so it might be they nice have to have, to be. yeah, it might be nice to have some kind of quieter areas there, that's, yeah, smart. I don't know if you guys talked to, at all about the idea of doing Nick Jr. anywhere no, in the park. not at all. So, so you know, you've got your Dora the Explorer, you've got your uh, Blue's Clues and the like. For every theme park, there's kind of like a little kid's sort of friendlier area yeah but i don't think that any of them are as well motivated as just a nick jr side area that's awesome i i was just picturing like a blues clues like live studio audience kind of show yes with like (laughs) you know like the basically the the backdrop of the stage is like an interactive screen where you know different stuff can pop up and like a clue a clue and all that stuff i i love that i love nick jr they did a lot of really good stuff yeah i do think like Making, like, age-specific or generation-specific areas is definitely going to help, not hinder you. We definitely also want to include the last 18 years of Nickelodeon programming that we totally ignored on the episode, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You guys mentioned the Angry Beavers, which that was one of my favorites. Oh, yeah, me too. Because um, you said something about, like, maybe exploring the house, but I was thinking there was, like, this one episode... There might have been several episodes, like... um where there was like a water slide that was going through the dam, because um, I think they were getting the, it was like the spawn episode where, where they, they were getting the fish that were like attacking the side of their house. <laughs> they made this slide to just go right through their house. I was thinking, oh, well, we could have like some type of Angry Beavers water slide or something. That is awesome. I really like that, and I feel like that works well with Rocket Power as well. Like that's um that's actually a really cool point because we had kind of talked about in the episode having the the like surface level transportation methods where you can kind of like take a bus around or whatever almost like a regular theme park but then also mm-hmm. having this kind of fantasy nickelodeon version of a sewer that goes underground and connects all these theme parks together and then that's another really cool one we could have like a futuristic zany kind of um system of like tube slides like water slides that connect one area to the next which would be pretty cool i mean you might have to wear your swimsuit all day which would be a little bit annoying but Um, I do like that idea of at least expanding, um, where you go. Maybe like the water park is kind of in the middle of the theme park. So then there's like, uh, tube slides that go out and like around the other attractions and come back. Or maybe like you're taking a tour of the, um, not a tour, but you're exploring the angry beavers house. And then someone just comes flying through in the water slide. Like, whoa, there's people like on water slides. Like where'd that guy come from? (laughs) <laughs> that'd be really fun like um weaving them together even more because this theme park's already kind of like a messy patchwork kind of thing which kind of mm. fits with the nickelodeon aesthetic but adding one more channel of transportation that's what we need thank you for that that's great no no problem anything else for nickelodeon while we're here mrs puff's driving school oh that's fun i yeah i really like the cars in that that show so would it be like an actual driving thing like you have to try to maneuver around the like the cones and all those obstacles and stuff. I, I hadn't thought too much into it, but yeah, that'd definitely yeah. be something we 
do. That could be fun because I bet um, driving those cars is not quite like driving a regular terrestrial terrestrial car. Um, there's definitely something else to kind of consider there. That's fun. I like that. That's a good setting. That's a, a good like um, easy attraction, like something to go do, like a game almost. Try to pass this driving test, and then there's all the like SpongeBob jokes you can make while you're in there. I'm curious about how we would do the SpongeBob character, like whether that would be animatronic or like a projection, or if that's an actual person in a suit, because that is a, such a lively, amazing character that I think. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like when you go to a regular theme park that has a SpongeBob, it's like, oh, it's a SpongeBob <laughs> mascot. Um, it's not the actual character. Like, it's obviously not. Whereas, I don't know, Mickey Mouse's personality is so uh, subdued and smiley and wavy that if you see a big Mickey Mouse waving, you're like, oh, that's exactly what Mickey Mouse would do in this situation. <laughs> SpongeBob probably wouldn't be standing there waving at you, like, jumping around. He would be, like, at least talking. So maybe, yeah. maybe a mixture of a uh, animatronic and uh, projection. That's pretty cool. I like that a lot. They can do. They have this technology that's like they can do um, projection on the face, like the parts that change as a character's talking. So you could have like basically a robot, SpongeBob walking around, um, and then it also has like a projected face that can kind of you know change its expressions, and they can have all the little MP3s. So I guess it's almost like a SpongeBob drone. Um, but that could work. And they could even combine it with a, a mascot character. I know that the scale would be a little off, like you have to be human size, but you could have a person controlling the arms and legs walking around, and then that way the robot doesn't fall over because robots aren't great at walking yet. But then you could have Yeah, that wow, that's that's complicated, but I think it would work. Have you guys added anything about the hidden temple or uh Right? Was it the Hidden Temple, the show? Yeah, Legends of the Hidden Temple. We we briefly touched on the game shows because we were like, uh, let's just do all the game shows. And then that was kind of the end of it. But we could definitely go into more detail on that. You could have, like, uh, the wild thorn- thornberries. They can stop you at the end of their ride near the Legends of the Hidden Temple area where, you know, you can go through the course or whatever. Oh, that's fun. Like, if it's an actual, like, hidden temple. Yeah, yeah. I like that a lot. Like you're exploring these ancient ruins and then you turn the corner and there's like a live studio audience. And then like <laughs> <laughs> you get to like compete in the game show. That'd be fun. I was going to say, we definitely need a choky chicken restaurant from Rocco's Modern Life in the park. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that totally works. Love it. We were trying to do as much like themed food as we could. Like um, we had the, the cat dog. They always had like a taco place they went to. So we tried to replicate that. Basically, any any restaurant from any Nickelodeon show would be something we want to put in this park and you know invest some time into for sure. So for the Spider Man theme park, which we ended up calling the Amazing Spider Land, um, it had like kind of rotating different names we could put at the beginning of it to kind of match various comic book and movie interpretations. Um, but with Spider-Land, it's basically like a slice of New York City, and we've got all the different members of the Spider family there, um, and then also tons of Spider-Man villains, and it's built to be as realistic as possible, where it feels like you're actually in New York City, and there's, you know, it's a somewhat confined space, and basically half of the city has been taken over by villains, and the other half has been taken over by the heroes, and they both kind of tell their own stories, and as a part guest, you get to take a role as either just being a civilian or you can be a photographer and try to like earn some, you know, some credits or some currency and also help progress the storyline by getting pictures of like the bad guy's hideout or taking pictures of this unusual Spider-Man who comes from the future or whatever. You can take these pictures and with those pictures you get to kind of unlock new additional parts of the story and um, you can help basically help your side in the battle of you know good guys versus bad guys. We left it kind of open so that it can be flexible and, and kind of uh, recreate famous Spider-Man storylines from the ages and also produce new ones here as well. So it's almost like you know you have a whole troop of, of actors playing good guys and bad guys and they're kind of improving their way through new through new stories all the time. So as a part guest, you really never get the same experience twice. And the path that each one of us takes kind of makes an additional strand of a very tangled spider web. So that was the the basics of it. I mean, there wasn't anything too crazy. Although now that I just said not too crazy, 
We had some crazy ideas for specific attractions, like um, a lot of the roller coasters would start when you just get into a taxi. A bad guy will like jump on your vehicle and like shake it around, and it basically is a 4D theater, like where your taxi cab like gets shaken up and like I don't know, it gets thrown in the river or whatever. Um, and then Spider-Man comes and saves you and pulls you out, and so it kind of feels like a thrill ride, but it's got a story to it, and there's a reason why your vehicle is moving in that direction. It's because you're inside of a taxi. And that's also why you can't just like get up, get out and run away because you're actually kind of harnessed in there with your seatbelt. One of my favorite Spider-Man villains is uh, Mysterio. Yeah, Mysterio, the special effects bad guy. I love that guy. And there's just so much you can do with uh, just like a an interactive ride, something that sits in still and then like you get like illusions and stuff. Yeah, we had we had talked about having some like some buildings kind of like transform like you're up you know in in like an apartment or something up high in a skyscraper and then like suddenly like the walls just like start peeling off or like the whole building starts to like kind of tilt we had all these like kind of crazy special effects things that you could do with like um almost like doctor strange type visual uh effects where you know you never realized it like you thought that was just more offices back there but but those offices are all just on a screen and we can just like suddenly change that whole screen and it seems like Something, you know, really trippy, Mysterio type stuff is going on around you. <laughs> um, you can have like a 3D or virtual reality ride uh, where you're in kind of like in a movie theater type deal. And, you know, the seats can move or go side to side or up and down maybe. And mm-hmm. you're, you can have like the screen be like your or the visor you wear. You know, you're swinging through the city kind of like Spider-Man. You know, you're, you're you're you are Spider-Man, and you're swinging through the city like him. Yeah, almost like the the Peter Pan flight at Disney kind of yeah. does that same thing. Where it that'd be cool. You you're suspended and you're kind of moving around through the city. Yeah, that'd be pretty neat. And maybe you're like chasing the Goblin or something. I was gonna say that uh, I think uh, Spider-Man's amazing friends should have a a oh, portion yeah. of the oh, park. I I agree. I agree. Uh, Iceman and Firestar, Mario. <laughs> I was going to ask which Amazing Friends you meant, but okay, you're talking about the TV show. Uh, I'm okay with that. Yeah, sure, whatever. <laughs> I mean, just just one section. Just give it you know, give it to the people that remember the cartoon. Come on. I, I definitely like the idea of, of referencing that and having like those characters. And yeah, I think that's cool. I like paying homage to the, the history of the series, even its kind of lower points. <laughs> Thing. Something like maybe the the train scene in uh, Spider Man Two, right? With the oh, Doc yeah? Ock, something yeah. like that, where you're on the train and then you know that happens and he has to stop it. That could be kind of yeah, cool but... if you're witnessing it. You can make that aug- augmented reality. So like when people are, if they have like a VR visor or something along those lines, when whatever which way they're looking, maybe like uh, Spider Man and doc ock or fighting outside the train or you know on it because i think they fight on it in one of the scenes so i mean that'd be pretty neat you could totally do something like this where you know you look out a window and you can kind of see like spider-man like swing by and you know yeah. he's, he's fighting doc ock or whatever you could totally do that even like in a car or something you know you're in the back seat you're a kid like going on vacation and you're bored or whatever you look out the window and it's like there's you know like a, a actual superhero fight is going on outside because it doesn't matter that your car is like you know moving at sixty miles an hour because those characters could also be moving that fast and having this fight scene in front of you. That'd be fun. Yeah, and at the park maybe you can like schedule what what time certain things happen. Like if you're in uh-huh. a taxi and you're like, oh, we gotta look over here, uh, and you're like, you missed it, and you're like, dang it, and then you know you gotta <laughs> go to the next spot or something to catch it, catch another oh cool fight or something. Yeah, I like that, and we could kind of like tie that in with like the the kind of social media kind of stuff that they're doing with the more modern comics where it's like you know instead of just being like a a newspaper photographer it's like a lot of taking pictures with with like camera phones and a lot of like social media kind of stuff it could be like doc ock just robbed a bank uh in the financial district and then everyone gets a notification of like where that is like it's a breaking news story and you can run over there and like watch this fight between you know spider-man characters and doc ock social media in a theme park can often be a distraction but i feel like if we lean into it and make it a part of the story and use it as a storytelling device it works better than just saying like at three o'clock watch the doc ock show as he robs a bank like that doesn't that really breaks the immersion i think like why do they have a scheduled bank robbery you'd think they would just go ahead and stop that before it happens you you get a uh, a direct call from Jonah Jameson who says, "Get me pictures of Spider-Man." 
Yeah, exactly. When you that's yeah. like why we liked the photographer angle a lot. It's because you can be sent on certain assignments to cover certain things, and you know maybe it is something that's not Spider Man related. You're going to go cover the new like the store opening or something. But then on your way there, when you get to the store, it gets you know robbed by the scorpion or whatever. And maybe you can get like a cam, like some kind of digital camera or some kind of camera that the park gives you that links to their home station or something, which you can go to the Daily Bugle and print out like a newspaper or article oh, of your picture that you took. That's awesome, and and I like the idea of of tracking the park guests' like decisions, especially in stories like this where they get to actually interact and like choose a side and things. You know, it could even include pictures of like you. You know, when you first enter the park or throughout the park, maybe they take pictures of you. Yeah, and so like you have like. You know, maybe you get featured in it. Like one of the the villains, like captures you, and so then you have a picture of like, I don't know, Rhino or something, like holding you hostage. And it's like, oh my gosh! <laughs> so it has like the story of you, your experience with the park, and like what you interacted with. And so each person gets kind of a newspaper covering the the action that they were involved with. I know they have like those bungee cords sometimes. We're at like malls and stuff. Like maybe have a kid uh dress up and attach to it and he can like they swing him up and down and stuff to like do like spider-man things oh yes that totally works we could have like a you know spider-man playground area where it's like just a bunch of cool stuff made out of webbing that you can play with and yeah and like you know spider-man's ropes like old web it's old webs that he like left hanging from lampposts and stuff you can kind of like swing around on them i really like that idea about the social media um because it reminds me of um the newest Assassin's Creed game has a feature where you can like take screenshots in like certain parts of the world, and then online people will see, like, on the map they can see that screenshot. Like, oh, hey, that's interesting. Maybe I I'll go look over there. So I think that wow. might be a similar vibe to your guys' park. There's like, oh, there's this that happened over here. It's like, oh, well, I should go over that way and see, check that out. That's really cool. And and another thing that, that what you just said kind of triggered is the fact that that's kind of user-generated content. Like, one player, like, takes the picture, and then other players can see it. We could kind of set this up in the same way. You know, if the first part guest sees Doc Ock running into the bank, he, like, you know, messages on this little, like, Spider Spiderland app saying, like, Doc Ock is robbing this bank right now. Then the park can kind of push that, that like, tweet or whatever out to all of the other guests so they see, like, this is actual user-generated content. This is actually happening right now. But it is kind of orchestrated and kind of um, being manipulated behind the scenes. But you don't need to know that. Like, it's just pretend like it's real social media. I think that's that's really cool, adding yeah. some user-generated content into it. So it's not all just, like, the marketing director is sending out these social media messages. I feel like there should be at least some type of, like, experience of being Spider-Man. For that, I was just thinking, like, maybe some type of, maybe a web slinging target practice or something like that or something that would make it feel more like spider-man yeah i'm totally with you and the main thing i want to feel would be the feeling of you know swinging on the webs which i don't know how you really do that in a convincing way i guess i mean you could do like a limited one like um maybe the attraction is like spider-man just saved you but he's still fighting this bad guy so he like straps you into this like harness kind of thing and it's one of those like big like swing attractions but it's like in the story it's like spider-man's like hey i'm gonna hang you by this web you're gonna be okay i'll come back and get you in a minute but hang on i gotta go fight this guy and he just like kind of pushes you and you go on this big like those big swings that like at normal theme parks you know you pay an additional like fee to go on um the like superman style swing we could do something like that um which might help to do that might kind of reach that uh goal but then also it'd be cool to do, you know, because there are so many spider characters, like variations on Spider-Man, different people behind the mask. Maybe there's some kind of like training academy for that, you know, um, especially the fact that Peter Parker has been a teacher in the past. Like there's an area where you can kind of learn about how the, you know, he makes his, his web fluid canisters and maybe do some like target practice could be vr it could be ar where you just kind of like point your your hand like you are spider-man and it like launches something out you can actually see yeah it's almost like a in a shooting arcade game you know where it's like okay shoot the bad guys don't shoot the good guys kind of thing um which would be something it, that would at least be you kind of get to step into the the shoes of a spider character which would be fun 
I really like Spider-Man. I, I'll, I'll be honest. I'm sort of skeptical about how he fits into a theme park mm-hmm. purely because Spider-Man to me is like the most personal of the superheroes of like the common common like he's like an everyman sort of superhero because all of his problems are very um are are very mundane you know um he starts out in high school and he's just trying to fit in and then he's got like family troubles and later on he's trying to make ends meet by working two jobs and also spider-man on top of that his main adversary is like it's just time itself like how do you manage your life it's it's a very relatable tale so like yeah and it's so much easier to kind of empathize with someone who is dealing with the day to day mm-hmm. than for somebody in a multi-million dollar business for like the head of a corporation or an alien you know like <laughs> either of those it's a little hard to relate mm-hmm. for spider-man it's, it's a very personal story so i'm worried that you'd lose that that's and fair it a theme park yeah and, and a lot of the joys of of reading or watching spider-man is is his like inner monologue and his like little quips where it's peter parker right it's peter Spider-Man. parker himself that's a great point and you would probably lose out on that unless i don't know we could do you know some kind of like I guess when you're when he's in front of an audience of people, he could like say those funny things, and we at least get like a little bit of a glimpse. But but you would never get as much of that inner monologue stuff as you do reading or watching. That's an interesting challenge. That's a good point. We had kind of focused on the more like fantastic comic book action kinds of things for the theme park, but I mean that's the part that adapts better to a theme yeah. park. Yeah, I, I, I understand that, mm-hmm. and I'm not trying to break down your anyone's no, idea. No, but here. yeah, you've got a valid point. It's just you know I think that's that's a part that I wouldn't want to lose. Mm-hmm. I almost wonder if it would be worth having Peter Parker as just like a normal guy with a. With like a with a, like a, like a photographer, like he's clearly mm-hmm. Peter Par- Parker, but he just looks like another guest there. That's pretty interesting. And then whenever like an event happens wherein like a villain is there, he quickly like ducks behind a building. <sighs> Dude, that's awesome. <laughs> you know? And and because he looks pretty generic, you could actually have like hundreds of of like hired Peter Parkers in you know in the crowd. So if it's like um you know we've we've got a villain in this sector and there's not an actual like Spider-Man actor anywhere nearby then we can like call one of the Peter Parkers from the audience and like just signal him to like okay hey this is you you're on uh you know put on your costume yeah. really quick and get out there. That would be nice like little like a uh, performance art it's just like well there's nobody here to stop me and then like he he's maybe drawing a crowd doing mm-hmm. some like fancy special effects and then like you know somebody parts through the crowds and spider-man walks up yeah that would be really fun and really immersive like if you're standing next to this guy and he like you know basically gets like a call and he's like oh and he like is trying to find a place to go change and he just like sprints you're like what was that about and then the same guy runs back and he's in costume and he like is like oh hey like as he runs by like that'd be really fun if you got those little like more intimate connections All right, our next park was the Capcom Cosmos, which takes um, most of the popular video games from Capcom and kind of like the Nickelodeon theme park, takes all these diverse pieces and kind of pushes them together. But one of the things I really love about Capcom is that they cross-pollinate their characters back and forth between different games a lot, and they reference other games, and I don't know, it's just a very kind of like toy box type of game company where their characters are totally down to play with the other characters even if they aren't from the same series at all so we had kind of decided to split this park up into kind of areas based on genre of video games like a fighting game area kind of an action rpg area and then um, a horror area because they have a lot of like scary games as well so yeah capcom was the episode that that was uh you know built by Cinema 7. Returning to the park, do you guys have anything you, you see you want to kind of fix up or add on? Definitely a samurai showdown uh, area where kids are going to fight each other. <laughs> you can either have the foam swords, where it's, you know, foam smiths around the park, or, um, you know, or real swords. I don't care. Uh, we'll have them sign, we'll have parents sign waivers. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not too serious on that, but... No, he's serious. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I mean, I I uh, I go to Gen Con pretty regularly, this big gaming convention in Indianapolis, and they have like a foam weapon uh, fighting tournament every year, which is really cool to watch. Like, you know, it's almost like fencing, I yeah. guess. 
like fantasy fencing. It's it's pretty cool to watch. So I think this could actually work. I like the idea of a tournament. I keep thinking about like Street Fighter and stuff, but I don't think we want people to actually be like punching each other, or kicking each other, shooting actual fireballs at each other. Like I feel like it should all be have a layer of foam in between it, you know, yeah. a layer of safety. I know you guys were uh, stumped on like Monster Hunter for a little bit, but I was thinking of maybe yeah. like a it's like a three D. Uh, video ride type thing like dinosaurs that pop up you know when they roar the air gets on you and you can oh that's cool you can even see like uh like the guy come in and fight him to save you that could be a really cool like the theater kind of experience too like yeah you know big special effects thing like up on a stage like the monster hunters versus the monsters that's that's cool i was also thinking maybe you could do something like that for resident evil but Maybe to get to the ride, you have to go through like a, a haunted walkthrough type thing uh, where people jump out and scare you, like dress like zombies yes. or something. Oh, that's awesome. Dogs like break through the wall and stuff. Oh my God, yeah. Video games are cool because they use like the language of control and of a, a controller to be able to interact with it. Like it has limitations on what you can do with your character. As opposed to real life, where if a zombie pops out, you can just, like, punch them and, like, stab them with your keys and run away. Like, we don't want that to happen in here. We <laughs> yeah. want it to be more intimidating than that. And you can't, like, put weights on everyone's shoes. Like, I don't know a way to, like, make it feel more tense and, like, you can't actually get away. Like, sometimes it feels in those games. Make it almost maze-like. Yeah, that's good. That's what I was going to say. Or even uh, have multiple entrances where you can, you know, enter without your party. Yeah. You know, and... You know, be feel feel that aloneness in a maze, but obviously you you know always have a way out if you needed it. Right, that's cool. It might be neat too if we could do some like cool technological things where like you enter through a door and it shuts behind you, and then the door just kind of like disappears. I don't know if it like the wall like slides down or something like slides away, so you can't actually go back that way anymore. Oh yeah, that'd be cool. Or even if it just shuts and locks behind you, it's like well now <laughs> I have to keep going forward. Like that's pretty scary. Then then it becomes an escape room. Right, exactly. Yeah. I guess that's it. Just a series of escape rooms. Um, there's actually at least one escape room I've heard of where there's like a an actor playing a zombie in the room, and like every ten minutes, it's like on a chain, like attached to the corner of the room. And every ten minutes, the chain like gets released a little bit more, so the zombie can get a little bit closer to actually grabbing you. Like in the first game, uh, like you don't encounter a zombie until you find that one first room, and he, he kind of wakes up or something. Mm -hmm. So it could be, you know, that relates to the first game. I like Something that. Something like that. I think that any any chance we get to like directly like do a, a shot for shot remake kind of thing, like a direct reference of like this is exactly what it looks like in the first game. I think I love doing that kind of stuff. That would be awesome. I also kind of like like the idea of making a game of um, like the preservation of resources you have to do in those games, like you know, like saving your ammo and stuff like that. Like it could be fun to to do like kind of a, a really really slow paced version of the the Mega Man upgrade experience like where you're going through this park and you have to like you know shoot these zombies but you literally only have like six bullets to get through the whole house that could be pretty cool and pretty intense as well you need to like try to find other ways to get around them and only use your weapon as a last resort it could be dual purpose because of dead rising so you could always oh, you know man. have another version of it where it's more ridiculous and outlandish as opposed to the seriousness of resident evil that's cool and maybe like um you can get some kind of like, you know, maybe if you have one of the weapons, like, you've already been through the, the Dead Rising area, and you have one of the Dead Rising weapons or whatever, you could, then when you go back to the Resident Evil area, you can use these, like, ridiculous, like, overpowered weapons, these, like, comical weapons in the Resident Evil scenario. It just, like, makes it a lot more ridiculous and maybe easy to get through. This just got from really scary to really ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I know on the episode, Andrew, you mentioned, like, because uh, our, our co-host Chris Hawk said something about, you know, entering through an arcade and stuff like that. And you mentioned a museum kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. We thought about, like, talking about the history of Capcom inside of a giant arcade cabinet. Yeah. that I, I think that would be really neat. And you can even, like, have sound effects with that, too. Like, each uh, display you walk up to. And you definitely got to have, I know you guys mentioned it, but you, you most def have to have a real arcade in there. With yes. arcade games. So true. I, I love arcades so much. And and like you said, the sounds of them and ugh, there's so much cool stuff, like hardware and software that I love. Yeah, it's so iconic. It's so iconic, yeah, you're right. I know we talked about like uh 
almost like a stage show where uh, Street Fighter characters would fight each other like live actors. I was wondering if we could can incorporate that into any of the other uh, games. I mean, definitely all the fighting games. You could do like really cool big matchups of yeah. all the, the kind of, you know, 2D fighter games for sure. Yeah, almost like a kind of like a finale show. You know, you have like this huge fight between these characters. And obviously, you know, like the most popular ones have to come out at the end, like Ryu and stuff. But and like just end it with some sort of super Hadouken. <laughs> yeah, you can have like a screen behind them, like uh, uh, show the effects of the move when they're doing it, you know, and mm. or you can have like the health Pyro. bars. Yeah, Pyro, you can have health bars up there. Oh, that's great. That's really cool. Yeah, it could make it feel like, you know, that guy got uppercutted and it looks like he's, like, flying up in the air even though he's not, you know, really flying up there. Yeah. Or even if he is, you know, we've got, like, a wire, like, wire fighting kind of thing. Like, we lift him off the ground and then, like, make the background look like just lines flying across the screen. We could add, like, a little counter for, like, combos. Like, it could show, like, how many hits are going on, like... All those different little pop-ups that happen when you're playing the game could be could be going down, especially if it's all choreographed ahead of time. You could even have like, you know, like the special gauge filling up, and then like you see the guy use the special, and like the gauge goes all the way back down. I know when we went to Comic Con, there was this thing where you could swipe your badge at different locations. Maybe you could do something like that, like if you insert a coin that you got, because I know you guys talked about getting collector coins, or maybe this is a way to get collector coins. You scan like your badge or whatever you got in the park with. And yeah, the collectibles are going to be out of control for sure. There's so many, so many characters, like we said, so many different games that Capcom has put out, and so many different like weapons and little trinkets from all these different worlds that we could put in there, like as as various collectibles or little pieces of art or or whatever. Like there's there's so much flavor we can sample here. It's awesome. What what was it you guys decided on Okami again? Um, we were trying to think of something. That was a difficult one. We basically come up with something where. It's like you can kind of interact uh, with like a paintbrush kind of peripheral um, with your environment, but we didn't really flesh it out super well. Um, have you played that game? Um, I've played like a demo of it. And I think my brother owns it, but mm-hmm. I haven't really played a lot of it. Yeah. I just remember it was very, very beautiful and the mechanics were really interesting. Yeah, we definitely wanted to have an area representing that, even if it just kind of looked like Okami and it's just kind of like a, a rest area or like a dining area. Um, it's a super beautiful game, but we didn't really come up with a super great way to leverage that, I don't think. Yeah, I mean, you could probably do something, like, where you could, like, interact with a screen. Yeah. Like that. Um, or I don't know if you could do something with AR or something like that. Because it would be, because the brush kind of interacted with the environment and the enemies, so it would be kind of interesting how you would have to do that. I, I definitely life. like the idea of kind of combining like an interactive art installation with like some kind of relatively simple game where there's just like kind of huge screens everywhere that look almost like a blank piece of parchment or something and you run your brush along it and like you know maybe the color coming out of the brush can kind of like change and transition and you kind of um, do follow some little simple gameplay mechanics with the their paint strokes to I mean you could definitely do some really cool stuff with that I just um, don't have enough experience with the actual game to see if we should like try to reference something in particular or just kind of do some like some cool paintbrush based touchscreen game kind of things i love the idea of it being a fluid continuity wherein anyone can step in or out of games yeah um you know as epitomized by marvel versus capcom and the like yeah and we were also talking about maybe um doing a little bit of that that capcom blending of flavors into like the Mega Man upgrade park like having yeah. uh, either you know like player skins or some kind of um, power ups or upgrades that are based on characters from other Capcom properties I think that'd be pretty fun if you're in the Mega Man area of, of Capcom Cosmos like you could see like if you want more you know hot Mega Man action here check out Mega Man upgrade and here's some like live footage or like the best of footage from last year or whatever mm-hmm. that's pretty sweet i like that a lot and yeah. it would also be cool to have like um we kind of talked about like having collectibles or like a little card that kind of like saves your progress and if you bring that that same card or id badge or whatever from one park to the other park maybe you get some kind of exclusive reward mm-hmm. we had basically figured out that a lot of our our rides for this might use a kind of similar laser tag ish 
mechanic where like you're on a roller coaster and you have to like shoot this giant monster that you're like fighting so it's like the roller coaster is the vehicle you're in and you're flying around and you have to like it's kind of like fighting the uh, ad at walkers on hoth or something it's like you're trying to like yeah. shoot them as you fly by and stuff um let's say this is in like 10 years or whatever when these parks finally open um technology will have progressed a little bit by then so maybe the mega buster or the X X Buster you get from Mega Man Upgrade and the headset with the AR visor, maybe that's something you can actually buy and take home with you. And then you could bring it into the Capcom Cosmos theme park, which is convenient because most park guests will want to have some kind of firearm to use during these rides where you're fighting a giant monster or like the Monster Hunter area where you just start fighting monsters. If you already have an X Buster, it makes uh, that a lot easier. You don't have to run around and try to find equipment because you brought it with you from home from when you went to Mega Man Upgrade last year. It's not like 3D glasses after the end of the movie, <laughs> You're talking about a pretty big piece of hardware here. It is a decently sized hardware piece, sure. Uh, and, plus, and plus, if you're on this roller coaster in the Capcom thing, you don't want to deny everybody else the opportunity to use the Mega Buster on this thing. But I'll tell you what. Maybe if you did go to the Mega Man Park, you get to use the powers that you earn there. Uh, Maybe if you have the data keyed to your specific badge or whatever, you get the Mega Buster just like everyone else, but you have additional powers on it because yes. you went to the other park. That is super good. And yeah, we definitely, it wouldn't be an exclusive thing. Like, you can only get them at Mega Man Upgrade, but then you'd have, like, a reason to kind of buy it and take it home. And maybe it has some use at home as well. Like, you could play, like, little mini games with it. Um, because, I mean, I don't know, like, if you think about where video game consoles are going to be in the next few generations, it's going to be pretty wild. Like the cost of VR is going down so quickly. Like, I don't know. I feel like it might be achievable to have, this is just a thing that people just have, like having a phone. I mean, not everyone's going to have one. It's not going to be that ubiquitous, but I do think the nerds would probably have one of these VR headsets. That's just like kind of in their car all the time. Ah, oh, the nerds. <laughs> So World of Xenoblade is based on this uh, sci-fi JRPG, and we kind of took elements from various different parts of the story of the series and combined them all together into this, this world where the whole planet is covered in a cloud sea, and there are these giant creatures called titans kind of slowly shuffling around this planet in this sort of orbit-type pattern. Civilizations have formed on the backs of these creatures, so... As a theme park, there are these huge animatronic creatures with the different areas you can walk around on and different attractions built literally like on the backs of these creatures. And the story is, is pretty simplistic if you want it to be. It's kind of like playing a role-playing game where you can get as involved in the storyline as you want to or you can just kind of focus on side quests and having fun. And basically the most unique thing about this theme park is that all of the attractions are built onto these giant vehicles that kind of walk around the theme park. It's very innovative to have the main mechanism for travel also be the attractions. That's very cool. Yeah, it's pretty weird. Like, even just exploring that is, like, that sounds like a fun theme park already. And, like, I don't know anything else about what's going on the actual backs of the Titans. It's going to be visually really, like, stunning and really strange. Because um, it's something we've never really experienced. Most humans haven't felt that, where, like, the whole, like, continent is shifting pretty quickly underneath your feet. There is a a device that they use in the Xenosaga games that's basically like a phone where like you get notifications and emails based on like where you are. So we kind of had this sort of location based um, kind of like quest trigger system where you know if you're in this location and you have this item, you get this notification that tells you like, hey, you can use that item on this quest while you're here on this Titan. Um, and one of the other kind of mechanisms is like it's kind of scheduling your day almost as weird as that sounds because if you imagine living in a society where there are these giant titans that like pass each other once you know once in a while um it's a pretty big deal to like know the schedule of like when your country is going to be next to a different country for example so scheduling your your voyage to figure out how you're going to get to the middle of the park or at least just explore more of it is kind of a big deal so you need to be able to figure out like you pay attention and kind of look over the fence and see like, okay, when is that Titan coming and which direction is it coming from? And like, yeah. I don't know, it's almost like trying to hop from one train to another train. You kind of have to be aware of the schedule of everything. So I'm treating the entire park as kind of like what happens when you take the transportation fun of like a, uh, a like a safari kind of uh, like a, like an RV, like go through this kind of primal area 
and mix it with theme park and role playing elements. I'm uh I'm thinking that like you know maybe giving each player like a, a cell phone type device that they could use to check their progress and like look at the schedule and stuff might be overkill. But you could mm-hmm. very easily have some sort of uh some sort of like kiosks on the actual titan things themselves and then if you're not like overcome with the majesty of the place you're walking to maybe you've been that route already you can pass the time Mm -hmm. by like also seeing okay what else is up in this park where will i want to go next and that might be a good way to kind of funnel that downtime into something applicable and you know if you want to get the most out of the park something that you wouldn't mind checking in on that's really clever I, i like the idea of having the technology be in the world as well instead of just in your pocket yeah. And also, that would produce more social interaction with guests that you don't know already. You know, if if they're they are just leaving the terminal and you're walking to it, they can just tell you when the Titan's going to be there. Right. Or you could like look at it together and be like, "Wow, it looks like there's like this cool mission over here that I kind of want to do, but I don't know if I can do it on my own." I see you also eyeing it. Do you mm-hmm. want to party up? Yeah, I think that that kind of social element that happens in role-playing games would happen in real life as well when you put humans into these same kind of situations it's it's basically the the cyberpunk equivalent of meeting at a tavern right is meeting yeah, at top like exactly. the giant bug skyscraper that you're traveling on <laughs> oh, so you come here often <laughs> bug skyscraper that's great <laughs> and this whole theme park i mean it kind of takes all of the things from our forgotten realms episode in season one the the dungeons and dragons one and just kind of puts it in this crazy sci-fi world and it's a lot of the same elements are still there the kind of social interaction and in the combat and stuff like that it's fun i hope that there's more theme parks like that in the future because i totally want to go to those i i would accept any excuse to play D D in the real world so if this is how it happens then sign yes. up i feel like we kind of focused on the broader mm-hmm. park but never got into like the details of like the individual titans i i love the idea of of even just having different visual themes, like different thematic design on each Titan would really help to differentiate them. And, you know, even if not every Titan has a huge, amazing attraction to it, there's still something attractive about going to that that world and checking out that Titan's culture and, you know, interacting with the the non-player characters, the NPCs that are living there. And just kind of like taking in the kind of role-playing aesthetic of each separate Titan as its own unique theme i think that's really cool yeah i mean we could um one titan called uh tantal and it's kind of like a snowy place it it's kind of it reminds me of japan in a way because it was kind of shut off away from the other titans and they were Hmm. in seclusion kind of thing yeah you're totally right and um the thing with seclusion that's kind of a cool point as well when when we're kind of designing the layout of like the traffic pattern of where all the titans are going to be moving in their like orbit type thing we could easily have, you know, most of the Titans are directly on your course if you're trying to go to the very center. But maybe mm-hmm. there are some of them where you kind of have to stay on um, one of the Titans that's kind of in the outer mm, rotation in order to access these ones that are a little bit further away. I think that's pretty cool. And not every park guest would necessarily recognize that on their first visit. But eventually they'd be like, hey, I've never been to that snowy one before. Like, can we actually get over there? Is that possible? I mean, you know, you have to ask around about that and maybe find some some really unique and maybe more rare side quests and collectibles that are available out there. There's also this, like, mini, like, group of islands. It's like a group of smaller titans revolving around one uh, kind of bigger titan. That's cool. So that would be something we could also uh, play around with as well. Yeah, that's awesome. I really like that. We might not need to make as much focus on each individual attractions as a regular theme park because this one already has just the the huge like majesty of this structure of the park with the the titans moving around and mm-hmm. then just like the storyline of of you know trying to collect all as many you know core crystals as you're interested in getting and completing the storyline of you know getting to the center of the park before like the bad guys do I think that. People can kind of get into that main story as much as they want to, but I do think that our, our like target audience is going to really appreciate just kind of the sort of role playing aspects of this, you know, the different characters and the different cultures and all of the different themes that are going on in the different Titans. So not that we shouldn't add more specific attractions, but I do think that just representing the world as as purely and as like interestingly as possible is a really good way to like make this park really what it should be. 
That's true, because you don't want it to feel too gimmicky or yeah. anything like that. Yeah, it needs, it's going to be a classy place. You know, it's, it's trying to represent, like, this whole this whole world, this whole video game series. It's like, this is a totally new thing from the ground up. I suppose one of the other titans you kind of start out on is uh, called Gormot. It's kind of a grassy, uh, wooded area. It's uh, kind of has, like, a giraffe look to it. So oh, that's cool. the one where you kind of see it's and it, off in the distance, its neck and its head. So that's the one that has a really nice look to it. So, like, if it's a giraffe-style, you know, biology of this huge creature, then that might be more inclined, like, to have, like, some kind of slide system or something going down the neck of the creature or, like, a zip line kind of thing going down. So we could include those, um, you know, less high-tech, more traditional, old-fashioned kinds of attractions that people just build to amuse themselves, you know, like rope swings and stuff like that, if the environment is conducive to that specific type of, of fun. Okay. Yeah, I think that would feel really kind of organic. That's actually a really good idea. Yeah, I think that'd be pretty fun. And, like, you know, it's something we can add that's, like, here's something to do if you're not super, you know, captivated by this specific storyline and you're just kind of looking for a little bit of, you know, fun. There's You, you should go to this Titan because they have, you know, some little games and, like, yeah, little stuff to do there. When you think about Xenoblade, um, you kind of... I have to think about like the original game and think about like the Monado sword. But it'd be cool if we could like have some type of toy or foam sword or something of the Monado. I love the look of that weapon, and I I definitely like uh, the idea of using it in our you know promotional materials. So I think that it should definitely have some kind of presence, either in the storyline or as just kind of a thing you can kind of randomly encounter in the world after the first game it has made it like a cameo in each xenoblade afterwards so oh, i didn't know that that's cool uh in x it was kind of it was uh goofy it was uh like one of the main character had like hairpins that looked like the monado oh that's cute and then xenoblade 2 what they do with that one uh i can't say about that one. Ooh, it, it, yeah it's it's in there you just have to go look for it oh that's cool I've been thinking about that a lot recently, about, like, the the impact that, like, you know, fiction can have on people, like, video games and stuff. Like, um, I heard someone's, like, phone go off the other day, and it was, like, the alert sound from Metal Gear Solid. And I was like, it's so cool that, like, you know, 20-plus years ago or whatever, someone was just making sounds for a video game. And, like, now so many people can, like, reference that that sound in, you know, videos that they're making or, like, their text tone or whatever. It's like... There are all these mm-hmm. unintended, like, ripples of culture that happen, which is so cool. Like, when they made Xenogears, like, they probably didn't think they'd be making Xenoblade 2, you know, 20 years later or 19 years later or whatever. Like, I don't know, there's there's such a legacy that can happen from creating something new. It's amazing. I, I don't know if you guys have ever been to uh, SeaWorld Orlando. No. They have a, uh, a virtual reality roller coaster, okay? The regular roller coaster itself is, like super boring but if you put that headset on you're like underwater and like you know run like riding around this kraken and stuff you could easily do that with xenoblade and they're like giant beasts they have which i think would be pretty cool yeah that sounds awesome we had, we had kind of talked about how to to do the combat because you can't really like hit stuff with a foam sword and make it feel realistic especially if you're hitting like a monster like i don't know basically the monsters can't attack you but you can attack them like that doesn't feel like a jrpg combat so we thought maybe you get into a mech to do your battle. So that would totally work. If you're inside of a mech already, then it's like the mech's like flight pattern and movement pattern is the actual roller coaster's physical movement. And then in your headset, you can kind of, you know, look around with your like targeting computer and like shoot at different stuff and have enemies and monsters and all kinds of crazy um, stuff going on around you. You know, maybe even like fly down into the cloud sea and it like shoots mist up at you and add those kind of like 4D experiences to it as well. So I really like the the overall environment of Xenoblade. I really like the like the city setup and the giant hubs and uh, all the like the crystal textures. So I just I just like to see all of that represented in like I don't know, at central areas, you know, where it's like you get that city feel like you're going out of the wilderness into the city and that's where everything is. But again, like a lot of them are surrounded by crystals and stuff. I don't, I don't really remember why or just, if that's just how the <laughs> world is. But I just think it's really cool to see, and I think that'd be like visually appealing to guests. 
you got it buddy like the the world design is so like is so careful i think like so many of the cool details are like definitely someone spent time designing this thing it looks so cool so we definitely will have our best artists on recreating those towns and making the towns feel lived in and real and sci-fi like i think that's one of the best things about disney is like a lot of the locations feel so magical and so different than anything else on the planet but they also feel so real so i definitely think that's what we want to try to aim for try to capture that that same feeling you get from the video games but way more real because you can actually touch it like i don't know that's that's the inherent beauty of a themed park is like it it looks like something it's not which is it's so cool so surreal love it you definitely gotta have a guy dressed as shulk run around with his shirt off um because of that (laughs) costume in super smash brothers yes you know when you go to the, the towns you can uh, meet up with other people and maybe it's encouraged that you meet up with people and meet new friends and you know make a party you could scan uh things to become friends or something like how the ds has uh friend codes or the street pass you could do something like that yeah i definitely think that like kind of tracking the guests progress and like who they interacted with what rides they went on what kind of storylines they completed i think that that's such an important thing of like the future of of like interactive theme parks like this i think that's that's totally like a gem that we need to really like make sure is there for sure you definitely need a mech there like the the gundam in japan yes that'd be a cool attraction (laughs) maybe you can have like a like a hiking thing for you know people who are very adventurous like that you can zip line maybe do stuff like that that's actually pretty cool like a lot of these you know they're on the back of these kind of strange creatures like some of them i bet are gonna have like pretty like intense hills and you could do kind of like the things that any other you know uh life form humanoid life form that lives there would kind of do which is like how can we you know like slide down this how can we make zip lines down this yeah i think those things would totally naturally evolve there so definitely you could do like bungee jumping like off the side of a titan and like down towards the cloud sea and then like kind of bounce back up oh that'd be cool yeah just just like kind of think about like how would people entertain themselves if they actually lived on the back of this creature what are those air machines you can go into and it you know makes you float and stuff? I, I think they're called zero gravity or like indoor skydiving kind of facility. Yeah, you could do something like that and have like the bottom of it be like a digital screen like you're in the clouds and stuff. Like around you is a digital screen too while you're in it. So it'd be the, uh, you know, maybe different like t- um, creatures and monsters and stuff show up. That sounds awesome. I, I just love the idea in general of having like stuff going on around you on in that, that like skydiving ki- type environment. You could even add in, like, uh, laser guns or, like, various, like, projectile weapons. So, like, you're basically skydiving while you're shooting, like, enemies and stuff on this this screen around you. Yeah, that'd be pretty neat. (laughs) That's next-level entertainment. Well, I believe that that wraps up our remodels and renovations for Season 3. Listener, if you have any additional ideas, we would love to hear from you. Please join us on social media. It's at Amusement Sparks. There's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Reddit. Reddit.com slash R slash Amusement Sparks. And I'm hoping to get more and more conversation going on there because doing this kind of creation, I feel like almost anyone can do it. We just need to like try it once in a while. And it can be really fun. Like I do this show because it's fun. Like this is my hobby. I'm not making money from this or anything, so Uh, You can get that same joy that I'm getting from this, especially if you join us on Reddit. Listener, you've got a job to do. If you haven't listened to the Cartoncast, please go do so. And while you're waiting for that episode to download, you could listen to two or three episodes of Empowered. (laughs) Thank you for dedicating your brain power to our cause of uh, lifting everyone's spirits through the joys of imagination. I wasn't using it. Oh, well, there you go. A few people <laughs> are, so. <laughs> Tyler, do you have a presence online we could check out? I'm one of the your few guests that really doesn't have a creative outlet. <laughs> um, uh, a Twitter account, but I mostly just um, blather on about Zeno stuff <laughs> at Cosmos Chaos, and that's Cosmos with a K. And I, I write for Operation Rainfall and work on Zeno fan projects on the side. For the listener, if you have not listened to Cinema 7, what are you even doing? Uh, please look it up. It's uh, Cinema, and then 7 is spelled 7-E-V-E-N. 
and you guys are on social media, right? Uh, we're on Instagram. Uh, we're on Twitter. Both of them are Cinema Seven underscore Podcast. You know, not only are we getting our opinions out there, but we, I just want to share like all opinions in general. Like, I feel like that's the most important thing is so everyone has a platform to go to, and you know, just creating a good community for podcasts. You know? Yeah, man, that's what it's all about. And uh, I, I really appreciate you having us on, and we we love like all your stuff. Thanks. I, I I'm honestly a, a huge fan of your guys' podcast. Like, I I don't know. It's it's hard to find people who take pop culture as as like seriously and as earnestly as you guys do, and I I really value that. And I don't know. I I like podcasts that you know where there's not like a ton of like swearing or making fun of people or anything. Like. I feel like you guys do a really noble interpretation of of that style of podcast. It's definitely my favorite one that reviews pop culture. There's there's so many podcasts that do that, and so many of them are really good. But Cinema Seven is my favorite. And yeah, it, it was a uh, it was really exciting to see you guys post that episode. I was like, oh my gosh, wow! Like we're sharing. I love that. <laughs> hey, that's what we need more of because I feel like people are too competitive in this. You know what I mean? They want to. Mm either steal ideas or are afraid to work with people. And that's what I like about your show is you have guests on and I, I just love all that. It's pretty cool. And-